Thank you for the opportunity uh, to um, discuss frontotemporal dementia and its uh, related uh, conditions. Um, my name is Mario Mendez, and I'm uh, the Director of Behavioral Neurology at UCLA. Frontotemporal dementia is uh, not just uh, one thing. It includes a, a number of behavioral syndromes, which I will describe for you. Um, please feel free to ask uh, questions. Uh, we want this to be interactive, and I'm sure that uh, there are many of you will, will have uh, questions, hopefully, after this presentation. Um, as you can see from this uh, image, uh, it's most illustrative of what we are talking about. The front part of the brain, as you can see by this uh, almost a sharp demarcation, indicates that the front part of the brain has deteriorated or is atrophic. The back part of the brain is normal. This is the uh, most singular picture for what we're talking about when we talk about frontotemporal dementia. Um, the presentations are usually behavioral, and that makes it quite distinct from Alzheimer's disease and other dementing illnesses. It also means that this condition is misdiagnosed the majority of time. Patients that we see uh, have come to us after going through multiple physicians and consultations. Uh, the most common presentation is that of decreased uh, engagement, decreased activity, apathy or inertia. Often people just uh, stop doing their usual activities uh, and become uh, quite passive. Other patients uh, have more disinhibition and impulsivity, doing things uh, that uh, sometimes uh, violate uh, our usual social norms and conventions. And then, of course, there are eating disorders, uh, carbohydrate, carbohydrate craving, uh, sugar craving, uh, food fads. Um, these three conditions, apathy, disinhibition, and eating changes, are the most distinguishing features of somebody with frontotemporal dementia. Uh, other early symptoms are an increase in selfishness, disengagement uh, in an emotional sense uh, from uh, loved ones and others, uh, and as I mentioned before, a decline in usual social tact and propriety manners, uh, sometimes violating social boundaries, and I'll touch on that a little bit further. Other uh, behaviors that you might see are a tendency to stereotypies or compulsions, repetitive uh, behaviors uh, over and over again. Rarely you'll see uh, other things uh, such as uh, aggressive uh, behavior, but that's not uh, as common as the other things that we've described. Uh, a little vocabulary before we, we proceed. Um, as you saw from the deterioration of the uh, frontal lobes and its adjacent anterior temporal region, um, this uh, is often termed frontotemporal dementia, but can be discussed as frontotemporal degeneration. The terminology can be a, a little bit confusing. And because of that, I want to throw in and explain three more terms. Primary progressive aphasia, non-fluent variant primary progressive aphasia, and semantic variant primary progressive aphasia, sometimes called semantic dementia, in, uh, other, particularly in other countries. Now, these last three terms are language disturbances. They're language disturbances. So when the frontotemporal degeneration affects the language areas, patients may present with a language disturbance. These are all considered part of the overall general frontotemporal dementia degeneration spectrum. Um, a little history. Um, it, this condition was originally described in 1892 by Arnold Pick and for many years was called Pick's disease until it was renamed in the early 1990s. It was Alois uh, Alzheimer who actually described the initial pathology characterized by bodies, inclusion bodies, that were silver stained inside the nerve cells. And this has become the hallmark of this condition, but the actual uh, contents of the inclusion bodies varies. 
For example, in, um, in 1997, we described how uh, much of this was abnormal tau protein. But subsequently, in 2006, it became clear that many had abnormal TDP43 protein. And after that, uh, uh, various genetic causes for these protein disturbances became important. The reason for presenting this to you uh, is because when we develop treatments, when we research potential rational interventions, we focus on the pathology and attacking tau, attacking TDP43, places where we can actually uh, make a, a modification. Okay, a little epidemiology. I'm going to go through this rapidly, it's, uh, but summarize it for you. Uh, in terms of all dementias, only about 8% have uh, an FTD syndrome. Mo uh, the most common by far is, of course, Alzheimer's disease. But if it's someone under the age of 65, particularly under the age of 60, then it's much more likely to be frontotemporal dementia. We have probably 20 to 80,000 uh, patients in the United States, uh, maybe many more we just don't know because of the misdiagnosis tendency. Um, some, in relation to Alzheimer's disease, the ratio uh, overall is one to a uh, patient with FTD compared to 65 to 70 patients with Alzheimer's disease. The difference is quite large, but, if, but I noted that if the onset is in middle life, less than 60, then it's almost one-to-one -one with Alzheimer's disease. Average age of onset, 57 to 58, no sex difference. Um, other patients, uh, uh, may, if they're older, may have some memory decline, like Alzheimer's disease, although this is a behavioral syndrome, as I noted earlier. Um, Average uh, duration, uh, three to 10 years. Uh, there are some metabolic changes, uh, uh, in particularly in triglycerides and uh, insulin levels that may predispose to the eating disorder. So this is uh, just uh, an illustration of our experience in our clinic uh, in patients with early onset forms of dementia. And as you can see, frontotemporal dementia syndromes constitute around 15% in our series. International criteria, which we participated in, uh, describes this as a progressive degeneration uh, with early behavioral disinhibition, the socially inappropriate behavior, we discussed this, early apathy, inertia, loss of sympathy and empathy or a diminished response to uh, others, particularly those uh, who uh, care for them. And this can be quite devastating and a focus of a tremendous uh, a barrier for caring for these patients. Um, stereotypical and compulsive behaviors uh, we discussed, uh, and the dietary and hyperoral behaviors. And finally, I would note that on neuropsychological testing, we have uh, relative sparing of memory, not always, but relative sparing of memory and visual spatial skills. Um, I want to mention some specific complications um, because these are so impactful in uh, managing uh, patients with this condition. Getting into trouble with the law, that has been uh, something that occurs when they cross social boundaries and barriers. Many pa uh, patients uh, go on to develop other complications such as Parkinsonism and some develop motor neuron disease otherwise known as amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or Lou Gehrig's disease of the muscles of the neuromuscular system. Um, as it progresses, uh, patients may become mute or they may have swallowing difficulty. And I, I uh, noted that, I, that there is some uh, occasional problems with the law and I, I don't want to overemphasize this. Um, patients have gotten in trouble with traffic violations, physical assaults, um, stealing, uh, going into stores, taking things without uh, paying for them, and so on. Often they know what they're doing, but the emotional impact of this behavior uh, is not salient for them. Uh, and this is something that we've had to deal with uh, in interacting uh, with uh, the legal system. Uh, just a few pictures. 
uh, I showed you the brain and what that translates to in neuroimaging in brain scans, as in this MRI scan, is deterioration of the frontal region. If you were to draw a line across the middle, the bottom part is normal, and these ventricular cavities are normal shape. And they should be close to that shape up here. But as you can see from this imaginary line, above that, they're ballooned out. And it does not reflect uh, an actual uh, pressure enlargement here. It just means that the brain around it has wasted away so that the ventricular cavities look enlarged. This is a neuroimaging picture of frontotemporal dementia. Um, on PET scanning, which is activity or metabolism, you can draw the same line across the middle. It should be black all over because that's brain activity. It's normal below, abnormal above. Um, and then uh, most recently, uh, we have been working on specific imaging techniques to tag the abnormal protein that is in these inclusion bodies, uh, particularly uh, aimed at the tau abnormal protein. This is one example uh, from Gary Small's work, a colleague here at UCLA, showing increased activity uh, when abnormal tau is tagged in the frontal lobes. And our own work uh, shows a de gross deterioration of the white matter tracts that communicate between this, these different areas. And as you can see uh, down here, uh, these are all colored white matter tracts it's as it, that communicate between the neurons and the sections of the brain. It is, after all, a, like a wiring diagram. And you can see that the wires, so to speak, uh, have disappeared in that frontal region. Uh, a few words about genetics. About a third of patients have some genetic background, but we've only been able to identify a clear gene in 13%. And the main genes are C9, ORF72, the mapped genes, um, and uh, the uh, progranulin gene. There are three rare genes, a uh, uh, valacine gene, uh, the charged multivesicular body protein 2B gene, which is as far as I know, has only been described in uh, Denmark. Um, TDP43 gene, these are rare genes. But the point is that, uh, so that as we move forward, we keep discovering some genetic reason for the deposition of these abnormal proteins in frontotemporal dementia. Um, I show this, uh, this is from my colleague Bruce Miller at UCSF, uh, because uh, there is a, uh, a European uh, consortium, and it extends to other countries now, uh, looking at the genetic background and where these illnesses originated. And uh, the most uh, uh, prominent here is the C9ORF72 gene, which is the dark blue. And it seems to have originated from the Baltic region in northern Europe, and particularly in northwestern Europe, and, uh, uh, and spread from there uh, to uh, other parts of Europe and uh, North America and beyond. So we can actually go back and find a, a founder uh, for, or a founder tendency for some of these uh, genes. Okay, let's uh, finish with some discussion of treatment and management. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, unfortunately, our Alzheimer drugs, which we use uh, for most dementia patients, um, do not work in this case because they don't, uh, the targeted neurotransmitter, the cholinergic system, is not what is affected in frontotemporal dementia. Yet there is a disturbance in the serotonergic system. So drugs that are called SSRI uh, drugs, used primarily for depression, uh, have some improvement in the behaviors, or may have some improvement in the behaviors of these patients. Uh, sometimes Parkinson's drugs park, uh, can help because there is a dopaminergic deficit. Uh, um, it, that is very individualized and uh, depends on the patient. We use psychoactive medications when we need to, and sometimes we even use psychostimulants like methylphenidate, otherwise known as Ritalin, 
uh, for uh, patients who are really uh, apathetic uh, with variable results and with caution in using them. Uh, Non-medical management, uh, the uh, Association for Frontotemporal Degeneration, which you can easily find uh, on the web, has a lot of resources, and I would uh, promote going to that website and availing yourself of their uh, recommendations and resources. There are dedicated psychosocial interventions uh, uh, that uh, we can discuss. Uh, support groups uh, uh, can be a real problem because of the relative rarity of this condition compared to Alzheimer's disease and the fact that people are younger. So this can be uh, an issue in getting to a proper support group. Daycare, uh, senior centers, respite care, they are also uh, more oriented to more elderly patients. Um, we stress care of the caregiver. Um, as I mentioned, caregivers are often particularly stressed because that human connection uh, with, uh, with their, their, the person that they loved or have cared for um, is not the same as it was before qualitatively. Uh, you know, we make a connection with, a, with somebody else, and it's at a various levels, uh, uh, and you feel the interaction. Um, it's, uh, often, uh, a lot of that is uh, lost, uh, and it can be very painful. Other community resources, nursing homes, legal and financial aid, uh, speech and language therapy, all of those are issues to discuss, as well as environmental changes, uh, behavioral management uh, uh, techniques. Uh, for example, um, how you approach a patient, uh, how you discuss uh, with them, how you guide them, uh, requires uh, some skill and uh, learning. Uh, structuring activities uh, can be very good as well, because uh, one of the things that the frontal lobes does really is goal-oriented goal behavior um, and initiating this goal-oriented behavior. You recall that one of the commonest symptoms is apathy and inertia. Getting people up and going uh, can be helped if you provide the structure for them. Uh, and I uh, always stress uh, the uh, value of positive uh, interactions with uh, family and friends, and this is a, the best stimulant for, for the human brain, particularly the frontal lobes, which is dedicated so much to social behavior. Uh, barriers, uh, there are specific barriers I want to stress, uh, finding resources for young onset patients. Uh, particularly when they have been at the peak of productivity or parenting. Uh, we think of dementia often as these elderly people who may have been retired, their kids are grown uh, and gone. Uh, they're not necessarily responsible for bringing in the financial resources and for caring for the young. But often, FTD patients are in that peak period of life, and that makes it particularly difficult. Uh, often, caregivers themselves are busy, uh, and the behaviors themselves can be quite uh, difficult to manage. Uh, often there's a lot of embarrassment over the patient's behavior in social settings. Uh, you know, patients will reach out and, and, and grab uh, mashed potatoes uh, with their hand and stuff it in their mouth. Uh, that, that is an extreme example of an embarrassing behavior that you might see. Uh, caregiver depression is, is a uh, uh, a consequence, uh, and I mentioned the poor connections with community social services agencies, and which can be exacerbated actually in a huge spread out metropolitan area like the Los Angeles area. We have experimental drug treatments, and uh, we're doing uh, investigation of social behavioral disturbances at UCLA. Just uh, a couple of points about our research very quickly. Uh, some of the things that we've been doing is investigating tau treatments, anti-tau treatments in this condition uh, with uh, experimental drugs. We've also used, uh, looked at the progranulin uh, mutation and targeting that particular uh, chemical, uh, but that's only in a very specific uh, group with that gene. Um, and there's a lot about the use of oxytocin, which is 
often called the uh, social behavioral hormone. And um, injecting some oxytocin nasally, uh, and that seems to increase or improve some of the social behavior uh, changes in our patients. Um, social behavior is disturbed in various uh, ways, uh, from understanding social concepts to uh, issues of uh, uh, recognizing facial emotions, empathy, uh, uh, and so on. We've done many studies on this uh, using uh, stimulus pictures such as you, you see here. Um, and uh, during psychophysiologic monitoring, most people see these type of pictures. Uh, this is a well-known picture from a well-known stimulus set, I should say. Uh, and most people have changes in heart rate, blood pressure, skin conductance. And we find that what underlies a lot of the social be behavioral disturbances in frontotemporal dementia is that they don't have this normal physiologic response to disturbing social interactions. Uh, and most recently, we've been working with uh, virtual reality to create environments uh, that uh, can, uh, where we can recreate a social situation that, it won't, that isn't out in the real world and won't be uh, detrimental or embarrassing or, or harmful, uh, an environment that's totally safe where we can evaluate and hopefully do some work at designing some intervention for their social interpersonal uh, behavior. Um, this, is, for example, is uh, from our, our colleague uh, at USC, uh, Skip uh, Rizzo, uh, and uh, this uh, interacting technique uh, with uh, uh, an interviewer uh, and uh, the uh, a person participating, say the patient, uh, has all of these uh, electronic monitor monitors on how they respond uh, emotionally, how they respond in terms of uh, facial reactivity. That's a little on our research. Um, we, uh, ha we now have uh, uh, the benefit of a somewhat united front across the planet. We meet every two years, uh, now for the tenth time. Next year in Munich, Germany, uh, where all of us get together and try to come up with uh, solutions uh, to this uh, terrible illness. And um, I would like to end there and uh, open, open it up for any questions. The uh, first question is, uh, how does uh, FTD differ from Alzheimer's disease? Frontotemporal dementia is different from Alzheimer's disease in that frontotemporal dementia is behavioral in its manifestations, alterations of social behavior, interacting with people, particularly disengagement, apathy, not initiating behavior, and sometimes really disinhibited and inappropriate uh, behavior saying the wrong thing, doing the wrong thing, touching people when you shouldn't. Uh, private behaviors in public um, is my term for, you know, uh, things that you wouldn't do. Uh, you would only do in, in, in private and you do it in public and it's terribly embarrassing to the family. In comparison, typical Alzheimer's disease focuses more on cognition, a loss of memory, for new things, episodic, new learning, things that happened recently, um, that is the most common uh, symptom in early manifestation of Alzheimer's disease, followed by word finding difficulty and some visual spatial problems. And as you can see, there is a vast difference between these two uh, types of uh, illnesses. And of course, the average age of onset of FTD. Uh, is in the 50s, whereas Alzheimer's disease is an exponential increase as we age uh, with a sharp rise in the 70s. How can I recognize if someone is getting uh, frontotemporal dementia? That is a, a very important question. In middle life, if there's any behavior change, change in the person's pervasive pattern of behavior, 
their usual overall pattern of behavior, then this should be a consideration. In other words, um, patients who, people who have, who are extroverted and interactive and productive and engaged and loving, um, and if any, anything changes in that pattern of behavior, unfortunately that could be frontotemporal dementia. And as you can see, the subtlety uh, of the early presentation and so on uh, is one of the reasons that this is so misdiagnosed, often mis misdiagnosed as depression or, or a midlife change or any of a number of other uh, conditions before they eventually come to us uh, for proper diagnosis and management. Um, what can I do to prevent uh, FTD? Um, the sad fact is today, at the present time, we have no way of preventing FTD. Um, the, uh, possibly uh, the, uh, the most, uh, potentially the most impactful study, uh, I'm not sure yet, is, a, is one of our uh, publications this year looking at uh, the impact of head injuries in we did find that head injury uh, is a risk factor for FTD as it is for Alzheimer's disease so that certainly is uh, a preventable factor um, and uh, just preventing head injuries uh, is uh, uh, something that we would uh, emphasize otherwise we are unaware of other ways to prevent this condition. Are FTD patients aware of their behavioral changes? Um, no. By and large, they don't think there's anything wrong with them. They come to the, they're brought to the doctor by their family and they, they may sit there and uh, you ask them, uh, why are you here? And they say, I don't know, my family brought me. I, there's nothing wrong with me. Uh, nothing at all. I have, uh, and at the same time, the family members are sitting right next to them, and they're crying, and they're extremely upset and disturbed, and um, they don't understand why their family member doesn't understand or doesn't see. Um, and that is um, the, and uh, often we help people by just explaining uh, to family that part of the illness is that FTD really takes away your insight, your view of yourself, and also explaining to the family that the patient is not really responsible for a lot of the behaviors that are so disturbing to them. Okay, so I'm open for any other further questions, and otherwise, uh, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity.